Hello, uh, I'd like to welcome everyone to today's event, which is co-sponsored by New America's Open Technology Institute and Future Tense, which is a collaboration between Arizona State University, New America, and Slate Magazine, which examines emerging technologies. Uh, my name is Josh Keating. I'm a senior editor uh, here at the empty offices of Slate Magazine. Uh, so today's event, you know, whether you call it the splinter net or the balkanization of the internet, uh, what today's conversation about is the decline of an idea that's been with us from the earliest days of the internet, of cyberspace as a kind of virtual realm that's removed from and outside the jurisdiction of terrestrial nation states. Uh, and obviously, you know, national governments have been chipping away at the idea for some time, but we seem to have reached a kind of inflection point uh, of this transformation, especially with the recent confrontation between uh, the US and China over the apps WeChat and TikTok. So it's a uh, great time to have this conversation. And I'll just briefly introduce uh, the very distinguished panel we have to talk about these issues today. Uh, Anne-Marie Slaughter is the CEO of New America. And she's the former director of policy planning for the US State Department under the Obama administration. Uh, she's the author of several books and most re recently, uh, and pertinently to this conversation, uh, The Chessboard and the Web, Strategies of Connection in a Network World. Uh, Rebecca McKinnon is the founding director of the Ranking Digital, Ranking Digital Rights Program at New America, which works to promote freedom of expression and privacy on the internet. Uh, she's the co-founder of the Citizen Media Network Global Voices and uh, the author of Consent of the Networked. And Madalika Srikumar is an associate fellow and program coordinator with the Cyber Initiative at the Observer Research Foundation in New Delhi. And she was a 2019 India US Fellow at New America, uh, where she worked on India US data sharing and explored the underlying privacy standards. Uh, so, Anne Marie, I'll start with you. I mean, the, the program notes for this conversation uh, took note of a speech by Secretary Hillary Clinton in 2010. Uh, uh, very widely uh, noticed speech where she talked about, you know, how the U.S. stands for a single internet where all of humanity has equal access to knowledge and ideas. And, you know, and at, now at New America, obviously part of the mission of um, of your organization is is very tied to this idea of an open international internet. And uh, I was going to ask whether you still see that kind of open universal internet as as a goal worth fighting for uh, in today's world? I do, <laughs> in two words. Uh, so Josh, thanks for that. And, and uh, I'm, I'm glad to be here. And this is a subject uh, that New America cares deeply about, uh, both the Open Technology Institute and the Ranking Digital Rights Project that Rebecca founded. But to your question, when I read the piece you published this summer uh, for Future Tense, uh, you start with uh, that speech. And I was there. I was standing off stage when, Pres uh, when Secretary Clinton gave uh, the speech at the museum. A number of us had been working on it for a couple of months, and it really was designed uh, to be a, a real statement of US internet policy. It was uh, based loosely on the four freedoms of Roosevelt, and we talked about, you know, freedom from fear, freedom from want, uh, and but then the right to connect. So in addition to sort of the foundation of traditional human rights, there was a right to connect. I, I do think we were naive in some ways, inevitably, that was a decade ago, and we did not imagine all the ways in which the networked world could be manipulated and distorted, for sure. But I also still think the vision of an open and secure internet, the way uh, OTI would frame it is open, but also secure, secure in terms of rights for the individuals using it, including privacy, and Rebecca uh, and, uh, can speak much more to that. But this is there's a deeper issue here. This is about what does the United States stand for in the world? Uh, it is not the internet as a separate realm. It is not cyberspace as an area, as you pointed out in your piece, that is completely divorced uh, from the world of sovereign states. Quite the contrary. My vision of US foreign policy envisages an open world physically 
as well as virtually. Not completely open, of course not. We can't, we can't just open all our borders uh, and it, we need all sorts of protections, but that when in doubt, open is better than closed. When in doubt, you focus on people more than states, on the rights of people. And from that perspective, for all the ways that uh, the internet has enabled authoritarianism, it can and does also enable democracy. It enables people to communicate to others when they need to take to the streets, whether that's in the United States or in other countries. It allows us to tell people in other countries what is happening uh, to us. It allows us to, to have actually what in Islam would be called the ummah, right? The, the sense of a brotherhood or sisterhood of humanity. Those are lofty concepts, but the United States has always stood for at least verbally, we have stood for this vision of universal human rights uh, and the ability of people beyond any country to enjoy basic rights and freedoms. So I still think that's worth pushing in the internet. Thanks, and, and Rebecca, to, to, to sort of take that uh, vision and, and get a little more practical uh, and nitty gritty with it. Uh, you know, you, you wrote a great recent piece for Slate on the steps that need to be taken to preserve uh, an open internet. And I was wondering if you could sort of summarize some of those ideas now. I mean, what are the, uh, in terms of policies, so what should be on mm -hmm. top of the agenda right now? Sure, and that's, I, was, I was at that speech too, and, and Anne-Marie moderated a panel right afterwards. And, and, and it sort of relates to some of my concerns at the time. Um, uh, and, and concerns now, and, and in the piece I wrote for Slate, I, I kind of started by critiquing current administration's approach to internet policy, which is sort of um, uh, making a show of, of taking action to, in the name of security, being tough on China, but, but not actually making us more secure, uh, and also mirroring um, the the internet policies based on national sovereignty that that the Chinese government uh, has advocated and and uh, um, propagated um, around the world, and so you know what what I called for um, also builds on I, I think some of the uh, some some of the things that weren't addressed um, uh, by the previous administration and its. Um, internet freedom policy, um, and and what I was concerned about, kind of ten years ago, really, was that um, it, we were calling for a free and open internet, which which we need, but there was not enough accountability and human rights protection um, being built in. That that there was too much of an assumption that as long as everybody can connect to Facebook and Google, democracy will will follow. Uh, without holding Facebook and Google and any company, whether it's TikTok or, or who, uh, accountable for protecting the rights of, of users um, and having the right regulation in place to ensure that, that, that people are protected and respected um, and that there be coordination across borders about accountability, but that also um, national governments uh, of, of many democracies were, were taking short-term actions to, to secure um, interests and, and, and rights, uh, you know, to, to address short-term security or economic problems, whether it's terrorism online or copyright violation, that were actually con going to contribute uh, to a more balkanized internet in the long run and a less secure internet for individuals um, as far as their rights were concerned. Um, and, and we've gotten to a point, you know, so putting the current administration aside for a moment uh, and, and the critique that uh, I think we're seeing in lots of places, um, uh, putting that aside for a moment, there is a breakdown in trust. Um, and there is also a failure of, of leadership and vision on the part of the United States to really articulate what is the alternative to a sovereignty-based internet in which governments say, okay, I represent the interests of my people, and so therefore I'm gonna block various apps or do whatever it takes to secure the internet within my borders, um, and then uh, enforce my own laws how I see fit, which unless you have a perfect human rights record, um, which is no government, but some governments much worse than others, 
um, results in that government being able to uh, abuse its power potentially through privately owned and operated networks um, to uh, reinforce its its power and, and sovereignty. And, and so th th that that is the danger. Um, and uh, also the, the potential of different governments to abuse their power against other citizens of other countries, right? So, so we've seen the European Union, actually, you know, there's been a, a court ruling in the European Union that, that has basically invalidated the, the agreement that enabled US companies to, trans, to, to, to process Europeans' data due to concerns of lack of accountability by, by our surveillance uh, authority. Um, and, and so there's lack of trust on all sides. And we really need a, you know, take away the names of countries, take away the names of companies. We, we, we need a universal set of standards for how people's rights need to be protected on the internet and the, the, the standards that companies need to be held to and governments need to be held to if, if the internet, if our ability to use the internet is going to be to actually reinforce our rights, enable our rights to be exercised and protected, rather than just reinforcing the power of whoever won the last election uh, at the right time when the networks kind of started to, to kick in. Um, and, 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 so, and that's why, um, uh, you know, in my piece uh, and, and elsewhere, and, and I, I've seen these calls not just coming from me, but from other people, we, we really need, you know, if there is another administration, uh, as we need the U.S. to step up and work with its allies to work with governments that are con committed to human rights and committed to improving their own human rights rep record uh, and practices to, to really step up and articulate, um, you know, here are the types of regulations we need to protect people. Um, and and here, here's how we ourselves are going to be helped held accountable and holding each other accountable to ensure that that, that the internet um, actually serves people um, and and that this in in turn is an alternative vision for what the internet is and that's a better argument for why people shouldn't use wechat <laughs> uh, um, uh, than uh, it's chinese um, uh, right uh, that that it represents a vision if, if you use the technologies run by companies that are part of a, an internet governance system that is human rights supporting, um, that will be good for you and your family and, and your community in the long term, as opposed to choosing technologies that, that are just going to re import, in, reinforce the power of the incumbent. Um, so we, that needs to be articulated. It needs to be articulated um, at an international level amongst uh, a, a number of, of governments with civil society and, and companies participating and, and companies also recognizing that they, they have to be held accountable themselves to um, protecting and respecting users' rights. Uh, and, and just kind of saying, okay, we have a, a free and open internet so that everybody from Kenya to, to, to Cambodia can, can use Facebook is, is not enough. Um, to, to have a, a world uh, in, in which human rights can be exercised and protected. Madhu, I know that um, there's been a really kind of active and vigorous debate on these topics in India as well, whether it's the, you know, the data protection bill or, or the uh, Indian ban on Chinese apps, which actually came a few weeks before uh, Trump started talking about TikTok. Uh, I'm curious, for, uh, from your perspective, how's the kind of uh, official view on, 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 uh, on a global internet uh, evolved uh, in India in recent years? I think you're still muted. I'm just gonna unmute myself. Okay. Um, a quick clarification. Um, so I'm no longer with Observer Research Foundation in New Delhi. Um, it's been a year. I mean, I'm sure they'd be happy to have me, or so I like to believe, but um, I have kind of since just completed my um, graduate program at Harvard Law. Um, so I'm just waiting till I kind of jump into my next role. Um, but to answer your question, um, and I think the best way to describe um, what's happening in India right now, um, and some scholars have called it this, um, that it's a two horse race, right? There's a dominance of US companies and a dominance of Chinese companies. 
Um, and India is a perfect kind of case study um, to kind of understand why or how um, these competing models of governance um, neither hold true um, for democratic societies. And just to kind of run through what exactly happened over the past few months. Um, so the first kind of instance, of course, in July um, was TikTok being banned um, literally overnight. Um, so this was in response to um, some, the offline confrontation between um, the Indian and Chinese forces, um, which left 20 Indian soldiers dead um, and an unknown number of Chinese casualties. Um, so in response to that, the Indian government um, banned 60 Chinese mobile apps, TikTok being one of them. Um, and this is, of course, I think one of the things that we can unpack through this conversation. Um, the other kind of development over the past few months has been um, the Wall, Wall Street Journal's, um, you know, revelations the past month. Um, so essentially, um, it was revealed that Facebook allowed a politician um, from India's ruling party um, to remain on its platform, even though his anti-Muslim kind of post flouted Facebook's hate speech rules. Um, but the post was not seen, was not removed, um, and there were allegations from current and former Facebook employees um, that the Facebook public policy director's um, relationship with the current ruling party um, kind of um, had something to do with Facebook not bringing down um, a post. Um, since then, since the revelations, um, the post in question has been um, brought down. Um, so these are kind of two interesting developments that happened over the past few months, which kind of illustrate that neither of these models are tenable for Indian users. Um, so just to kind of quickly go through some stats, right, just to understand the dominance of these companies in the country. Um, so TikTok came into the market in 2018, um, but India, I mean, till it was banned, um, was a third, I mean, was, had a third of TikTok's users. Um, and essentially, a third of all Indian smartphone users um, were on TikTok. Um, so essentially, Indian users are the largest kind of user base for TikTok. Um, and the same holds true for Facebook as well. Um, so there are 270 million Facebook users. Um, and of course, there are, you know, all of this, you know, nuggets of trivia you'd find if, if India's Facebook audience were a country, then it'd be the fourth largest country in the world. Um, so that kind of really drives home the point, which, which I brought up earlier, which is that it's a two horse race. Um, and essentially what we saw with the Indian government um, in responding um, to both of these models is kind of reasserting their sovereignty over the cyberspace, right? Um, so with the Facebook instance, we can see that there has been a breakdown of incentives, um, that it was, you know, given the kind of pressure that the company is currently under in India, um, since they have been, you know, called in to localize their data, which is essentially the idea that you store um, and process all your data through Indian servers. And in some cases, you don't transfer the data abroad. Um, given the pressure, this specific pressure that the company was under, uh, that that inherently affected its um, judgment on across content as well. Um, so here we're seeing a dominance of, you know, companies across content, social media, news, and payments um, with WhatsApp payments and Google payments, um, that increasingly um, the regulatory pressures um, are kind of preventing, um, you know, are, are not essentially um, allowing companies to respond the same way they would in US. Um, so what that reality has inherently lent itself to um, is that neither of these models are um, agreeable to, you know, um, the government in, you know, if you go to the Delhi corridors, you're never going to hear this. Um, and I think what could potentially be the way, I mean, it's not the way forward, but what the trend that's, you know, kind of been coming up is, you know, Chinese or um, American tech companies investing in Indian tech companies. And that seems to be the next frontier of how, you know, potentially companies might want to deal with um, regulatory arbitrage, right? So again, in the span of last few months, Facebook made the largest investment in um, India's largest telecom player called Jio. Um, so rely, I mean, Facebook invested $5.7 billion for a 9.99% stake. Um, so that's something to watch out for as well. Um, I think that responds to, um, you know, given, it responds to two realities, right? The first one being that the Indian government is and has shown willingness um, to go after, you know, American companies and Chinese companies. So they essentially see a local partnership as a way forward. Um, and the second reality is that this could bode well 
um, for Indian users from an economic front. There's local output being created. There's more to be taxed, which has always been a concern for um, the Indian government. But it's unclear how it's going to board for human rights um, and for the redressal rights of Indian users. And we haven't seen that play out yet. Um, so I'd be kind of, I mean, I'm not sure I'm really kind of helping this conversation. I'm muddying it, if anything, adding a new piece of information, if you will. But this could be something that we're going to see a lot of as well, um, that to kind of curry favor with, um, you know, southern governments um, and with the growth potential in several markets, that we're going to see a lot of this happen. Uh, and it's, it's worth exploring. Thanks, so Madhu. I, I apologize for misidentifying you, and uh, congratulations this for uh, fun, graduating yeah. law school. Um, <laughs> I want to remind um, viewers that you can ask questions to our panelists by uh, dropping them in the Q and A tab at the bottom of the screen. Um, Henry, I, I'm curious. You know, looking at the the TikTok affair in particular, I mean, what what do you see as the uh, kind of lasting impact of this on you know U.S. credibility when it comes to talking about um, issues regarding the open internet and 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 uh, and open access. Well, um, you know, I, I, the current administration does not believe in an open internet or open access. So there's no hi hypocrisy from its point of view. It, it believes in digital sovereignty. It accepts the Chinese vision. And the the, que the initial question was, you know, is there an alternative vision? Uh, that citizens anyway should be promoting. And I would add Europeans, Indians, to Madhu's point, uh, and the world would be a better place if there were more competition uh, on the company side and if companies were in fact competing on the, on the basis of respecting digital rights, exactly the ranking digital rights project where they are saying we are more accountable we preserve your data we do not <laughs> we we are are here are our hate speech policies uh, so i i actually uh, think that when we talk about openness we also want open competition and i i should have clarified i i totally agree with rebecca's point that open should come with i would i would look at the open government partnership principles of being a transparent being participatory, inclusive, and accountable, and then fleshing that out. Uh, and it, it is vital that we, that we do not have a world in which states are locking down their internet, but companies are also engaging in, in Madhu, when I hear you, I, all I can think of is sort of digital colonization. Right, that's a that is not a, a way that we want we want to go. So the 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 alternative vision that if there were a Biden Harris administration, uh, that I think we would be pushing for would be to work with a number of other countries, including Europe, who's way ahead of us. Although maybe it, that's not necessarily uh, the optimal American vision uh, of what an open internet, open and secure and accountable internet should be. But it's it's better than what we've got now working together with other governments to adopt what are global norms and then insisting that companies abide by those norms because they are not just platforms, they are publishers and they wield enormous political power and they wield norm, enormous responsibility precisely for the polarization and decline of trust that we are seeing. Rebecca, when we when we talk about um, the kind of nationalization of the internet, that can mean everything from data storage laws to censorship to the GDPR to um, uh, to, to recent internet shutdowns like we've seen in Belarus and other places. I mean, uh, from your perspective, uh, which of these is kind of the one that's or, or the one that's most serious or, or a um, you, you know when when we talk about the the splitting of the internet. Uh, um, which do you see as, as the kind of uh, biggest long-term threat? Yeah, well, Josh, it's, it's really hard to, you know, pull, pull in, you know, these are all very intertwined, um, mm. and, and it's, it's very hard to kind of pull out one thread. But what it all boils down to in the end is power. And do you hold power, how do you hold power accountable, whether it's the power of a company to decide what you can and cannot do on a platform, what you can and cannot see, what's prioritized for you to see, um, who is targeting you um, uh, with content on that platform, 
th those are all forms of power, a as is government power to to monitor, surveil, uh, to you know, to and 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 also exercise power to to regulate companies. So how do we make sure that all these different forms of power exercised through through digital platforms and networks are held accountable and are supporting human rights, right? And and you know we we need to when we're thinking about freedom and openness, right? Well, we're not talking about a state of nature, right? <laughs> we're, 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 right? The state of nature is not compatible with human rights. It doesn't mean free for all. You can do anything you want. You know, you can go anywhere and do anything you want. In 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 such a state of nature, probably the three women here wouldn't wouldn't be present right um you know there's <laughs> this is not you know internet freedom or or even free speech for that matter is not about just anybody can do anything they want because if that's the case then whoever has the most money can pay to target others with speech while those with no money are just subject to to whatever rules are put in place so we we need to think about how you hold power accountable in the internet age, how you enable global networks, uh, you enable activists across borders to to uh, organize and 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 mobilize um, for all kinds of different causes, whether it's climate, whether whether it's anti-corruption, whether whatever it is, right? You 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 need that. Um, but the problem is our institutions for holding power accountable are, are still from the analog age. We have not upgraded them. Um, and that's what I talked about in my book, you know, uh, back in, that we came out in 2012. The good news is, is that I think in 2012, not many people were sort of really recognizing how much hard work needs to be done to figure out how you hold power accountable in the internet age so that individuals can wield it and that violations of rights are both can be known <laughs> and you know who's done committed them and you can hold them accountable we're, and we're quite far from that right now but we're at a point in history where we're kind of governance and this is you know Anne Marie is a scholar <laughs> can talk a lot about that where, where sort of a lot of governance and accountability mechanisms need to be rethought but but it's also an age-old issue, right? The, the issue is, if you're going to be an open society that protects human rights, how do you do that and also protect people from real security threats? How do you, how do you organize law enforcement? How do you organize national security and you know, track down bad guys who kill people um, while not using the apparatus of security to violate rights and in and holding accountable sufficiently holding accountable those with the with that power um so that they cannot get away with that and and again we're still pretty far from figuring that out but i i do want to mention one thing about tiktok and then i'd, I'd love to hear Madhu's perspective on this as well you know, one of the interesting things about this TikTok deal uh, that, that, you know, kind of, if it goes through, will go to, to cronies of, of the, the current occupant of the White House. Um, and, you know, Oracle, which is the, the, the primary company that would house the new entity's data and, and manage it, its primary, you know, one of its major sources of business it's not managing a social network, but it's on tracking and profiling and collecting data on people and selling it to ad tech networks. And so, so actually, if, if you combine that capability with TikTok's algorithm and uh, a, you know, policy preferences by people who might be influenced by an administration who thinks that content moderation shouldn't happen um, uh, and, and has issued executive orders essentially to that effect. Then you have a really great targeted misinformation and hate speech vehicle in the hands of people who are allied to a particular party that happens to be in power. You know, I'm, I'm describing a hypothetical scenario. It hasn't happened that way, and it may not. 
but there's nothing in our law currently that prevents that from happening. And and so, you know, that that is, you know, putting aside what the real threat is uh, coming from China or elsewhere, that's a security threat to, to our democracy that Congress need, can address and, and must. Thanks, Rebecca. Madhu, the, the kind of um, uh, most best known or uh, uh, most discussed example of like a national internet is uh, probably China's Great Firewall. Uh, and I'm wondering from your perspective, you know, how influential is that model when other governments are sort of tempted to move into in that direction? Is, is China the model that they're following? Is, are, have they kind of set the standard for, for this, you know, more closed nationalistic vision of the internet? Sure, and like kind of before getting into this, I just want to quickly respond to sure. um, uh, what we've been discussing. Um, the idea of alternate vision sounds like the way to go, right? I feel like we haven't really settled on the idea of open internet yet. Um, I mean, we have that ideal of an open internet, but we haven't necessarily seen it in action maybe in the past decade. Um, so the question really becomes, what should the alternate vision look like? Um, and what's increasingly becoming clear is that it's, um, it has to be a vision that allows for local competitiveness, right? Um, I think you would allow, I mean, in, you would hope um, that companies can be divorced from the, you know, the states they come from and the interests um, that they may or may not represent. Um, but I think um, that ship has sailed at this point. Um, I think in um, you know, India's kind of public psyche, there is a very wide uh, recognition that um, um, these are Chinese companies, these are American companies, um, and India has a reason to kind of um, carve out their own path. Um, so what was earlier potentially a recognition you would have heard in some Delhi circles, um, you know, in policy circles, just the same, you know, 10 people kind of talking about these issues, that's no longer the case. Um, given the TikTok ban, um, you know, how it occupy primetime news in India, um, I think that there's a wider recognition um, and across um, uh, the public, um, um, you know, mandate as well. Um, so essentially, the question then becomes, how do you bring about this local competitiveness? And I think that's a tricky question. Um, I love Rebecca's suggestions that she put down in her piece that, um, you know, you need to increase mutual trust. Um, you need to bring up, you know, regulation to kind of um, go after the data collection and uh, practices of tech companies. Um, and I think the third kind of prong to that is how do you, um, you know, kind of encourage local competitiveness, be it in Europe or be it in India. And I think that's a tricky portion. Um, and I'm not sure how exactly we're going to respond to that. Um, some Indian ministers have kind of toyed with this idea of having, you know, open protocols, you know, having systems without any gatekeepers um, that allows anyone to be a player, um, essentially the open internet that we all envision to begin uh, with. And if that vision were to materialize, I think there's something there. Um, but I think, you know, if you step back from that, um, open internet as is, um, I don't think really holds much. Uh, I mean, I don't really see that being the way forward necessarily. Um, and kind of the second, you know, in, a, in addition to the same argument is that um, tech companies have increasingly recognized that they can't necessarily forward this idea of open internet anymore in New Delhi either. Um, so you see with WhatsApp, they have agreed to localize um, their payments data. You see with Google, they've agreed to kind of lo localize their payments data. So it's essentially a mandate which came from um, the Reserve Bank of India, um, which is financial um, nodal agency, um, that they have to um, store and process financial data um, to be, uh, be able to operate in the market. Um, and um, WhatsApp's first market for the payment services was India, and as is Google, if I'm not wrong. So the stakes are invariably higher at this stage when services are being launched in this country that they're willing to kind of accede to some of the, you know, mandate um, or, you know, the central government's um, kind of demands, which they wouldn't have, let's say, even a couple of years ago. Um, so I think this kind of increasing realization that it, tech companies are not necessarily holding um, the front for the open internet, not in New Delhi at least, um, and this realization of, oh, which I think, uh, and I can be challenged on that, a wider realization um, that, you know, Indian citizens think it's okay for an Indian model to come up. 
Um, so the question really becomes and kind of responding to, um, and I think some of this responds to your question um, that, you know, as we may, you know, we heard already, um, the Indian government, Prime Minister Narendra Modi is, I'm sure, fascinated with the Chinese vision as much as the current administration here in the US. Um, so I think for, for folks who want to kind of put forward um, this idea of open internet, uh, the real work that has to be done is kind of figuring out um, how do we create these open systems. Um, and I'm not sure we're dedicating as much resources to that conversation, um, but I think that's the way to go. Finding you know, um, open protocols or APIs, um, you know, some way to kind of um, divorce um, the content from the gatekeepers. Can I just respond, uh, Josh? I mean, I think, I, I think if we're, we're thinking about local competition anywhere, part of the problem is there isn't a positive alternative that is free. Right, and, and so you've got, you've got the business model is, is, is at the heart of this, means it's free because if you've just seen the social dilemma or read any of this, we users are actually the product, right? We are in, in surveillance capitalism. But, and there are people, of course, working on designing civic health into platforms. Eli Pariser has a, has a, a program. A lot of people have thought about that. But, and you can imagine a subscription service that says, yes, if you don't want your data to be used this way, if you want your company to, to actually be accountable in all these ways, here it is. But nobody has a way of doing that for free. So then you've got something that you have to pay for against something that is for free, which is just like the publishing world. You know, you, the, the, the things behind a paywall have a small, much smaller user base or customer base. And that, so when we, I do think part of the answer has to be that you design much more positive trust building accountable uh, elements into the very software, but then for them to compete, you're going to have to also make it much harder to do to work with the current business model of essentially luring users in giving them free product and then profiting from them. Yeah, that may or may not have been the question you were asking, but I, I it, it might have prompted it. No, I, my, my, my next question actually kind of follows up on that. I mean, I think that sometimes some of the pushback you hear towards, I guess you could call traditional American rhetoric on the open internet is that uh, it's really just this sort of pretext that Americans use to promote their own interests, whether it's, you know, uh, facilitating surveillance by the US government or, you know, opening markets to, you know, the big American tech companies. Uh, I guess my question, and I, I guess I'll address it to Rebecca first, but anyone who wants to answer can. Um, it, you know, in order for, you know, to, to have a truly open internet, does the internet also have to become somewhat less American? Hmm. Makes sense. Well, yeah, absolutely. I, I think that um, it, the onus is, it, is on us to prove the skeptics wrong and to, and to show that we're willing to be held accountable. Um, and so far, we've not done enough to build trust that we've not done enough to demonstrate that we're holding our own uh, government agencies accountable or companies accountable. Um, and, and so we need to do a lot of work if, if anybody has, if, if we think anybody has any, any reason to listen to anything we say. Um, one, one thing, Anne-Marie sort of gave me a, an excuse to uh, promote the work of, of my colleagues at Ranking Digital Rights, if you go to rankingdigitalrights.org and click on the widget that says it's the business model, um, my colleagues produced a, a couple of reports earlier this year just talking about the, the, the problems related to human rights and the regulatory challenges related to the targeted advertising business model that fuels the internet giants. Um, and, and that, that, that indeed I agree, uh, we need more competition. Uh, they should not be so dominant. There needs to be alternatives. Um, but there, there are also some uh, suggest policy suggestions in there targeted at the US, but, but uh, some in other countries are finding them useful. But the US, you know, these companies are headquartered in the United States. We've got to step up and take mm -hmm. responsibility for what we have created and, and do the work to show that, that uh, the platforms that, that, that originate here, that we have the ability to regulate, can be held accountable for respecting users' human rights. 
I don't know if Maru, you wanted to respond to that or? Um, I mean, I would love to hear um, from both of you about, I mean, I guess we don't know enough yet, but this idea of, you know, US companies partnering with local companies, right? Um, I mean, I haven't really come out on either side of this. I think it's fairly complicated because um, we don't know how it's going to operationalize. Um, but yeah, I'm curious to hear whether you would necessarily see that um, as furthering the balkanization of the internet. Um, or maybe is that a good outcome even that, you know, that helps with the local competitiveness piece that we were discussing? Uh, I would start by referencing something I think both Josh and Rebecca have written about, which is to say that we, we now have to start from a degree of balkanized internet, right? In other words, we can't, we're, we're not where we were 20 years ago. China, China has its firewall, but you know, European countries were talking about digital uh, sovereignty five years ago, right? Germany had a very strong idea in part to protect against American companies. Uh, and, and as you say, India has its own view. So I actually think you, you have to accept that right now you, 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 you you're not going to have a completely open internet. The question is, can you have a more open internet that is rights regarding? And that part, it rights regarding of all human beings, both nationally uh, and, and globally. And there, you could imagine allowing partnerships if those partnerships met certain standards. And those standards would then have to be enshrined in both national and I would hope international law. Again, we do not have a set of, inter we have the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, we have human rights treaties, and a lot of people, including ranking digital rights, have been translating those rights, but nations into the digital world. But nations haven't embraced the, those translations as much as they, they have. But I can imagine those partnerships as a way of really helping build uh, local uh, competition, but then you have to have antitrust laws and privacy laws and surveillance regulation uh, built in. Otherwise, you're, what you're getting is a geopolitical conflict between Chinese companies and American companies. And as I said, that, we've seen that movie before. It's, it's called uh, Colonization. I mean, so obviously we're sitting here looking at each other in tiny boxes on Zoom instead of uh, on a stage in Washington. And, you know, the pandemic has moved so much human activity online, not just organizations like New American Slate, but, you know, the upcoming G20 conference and uh, the recent General Assembly. I mean, given the kind of shift to online that we've seen during this pandemic, what kind of lasting impact do you see that having on uh, on internet governance and the way that uh, uh, governments behave as as actors on the internet? And that one's for anybody who wants to answer it. I'll jump in. I mean, it just makes it all the more urgent to ensure that that we that pe everyone has access to the internet for the for starters, or you can't even go to school these days. Um, or and 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 that that the internet is designed and regulated and governed in a manner that is inclusive, that respects the rights of people regardless of whether they're able to pay for advertising, um, regardless of where they come from or what their religion is, um, and you know that that we have we have an internet that that does enable everyone to be respected and protected. It's it's it makes it all the more urgent. Just speaking to Madhu's you know thought, you know I think it you know. Uh, partnerships between U.S. and Indian companies, I guess, you know, it's sort of up to the Indian people and Indian civil society to hold those new entities accountable. Um, uh, and, and, and we've all got to step up and hold everyone who's exercising digital power over us <laughs> accountable and, and also become more active in building alternatives, um, which is something that uh, every, everybody here is also involved with. Uh, we have a couple questions from the audience uh, about uh, multilateralism. Oh, and by the way, you can still ask questions uh, at the bottom of your screen. Uh, uh, Liesl Bruner asks if something like the EU's code of practice on dis disinformation 
could be a model of what governments can do to seek greater accountability. Uh, Sam Gautam asks, what role would the UN play in uh, developing you know, a universal standard for the internet? Um, so I, I, I guess just so, as a sort of general question, what, what, what kind of uh, multilateral frameworks do you think are you know, most useful when sort of developing universal standards um, for these questions? Well, I can jump in on the second one. I think the first, the European one's probably for Rebecca Amadu. Um, but, you know, the United Nations has been trying to, first of all, articulate a concept of digital cooperation that uh, issued a declaration of interdependence. It was chaired by Jack Ma and Melissa Gates, Melinda Gates. Uh, so looking globally uh, in terms of, of what uh, a world in which we cooperated digitally would look like and what the, what guidelines and rules would have to have to be in place. Uh, and there are other uh, efforts. There's a, there are also, of course, civil society efforts. I'm on the board of the Cyber Peace Institute, which is, is trying to support those kinds of, of norms. But I will say that digital multilateralism is only as strong as real multi or physical multilateralism. If you have a, if the, the current US government has absolute disdain for international institutions. So the United Nations can, cannot possibly uh, put out something that is going to, to hold with, with one of its most powerful members flouting it. And of course, that gives every other government who has no interest in those rules plenty of, of wake to say, yep, we're, we're just following the United States, or not to say anything at all, but not to, not to support it. So I can imagine a UN role, but it has to be a UN role supported by uh, a number of very strong member states. Um, uh, yeah, um, I, I, I agree with that. I mean, the, the UN role is tricky in that, you know, the UN Human Rights Council, for example, um, you know, had a resol resolution that was also approved by the General Assembly affirming that human rights extend online. And that was really critical. And, and you have the special rapporteurs and kind of the human, the human rights system within the UN has been doing a lot of work uh, around also business and human rights and, and holding tech companies accountable and what should those mechanisms be. On the other hand, uh, th there, there's, there was a fight in, in the last decade over who set standards, who sets the technical standards for the internet. And the human rights community was very much against that function being held by the United Nations because that would exclude the technical community and civil society from participating and it would just be up to, you know, majority of vote amongst governments, many of which do not respect human rights of their people, uh, to determine what the standards were. And, and so, so for some functions, you actually want a much more multi-stakeholder process that, you know, maybe the UN relate, is involved with, but is not just the governments coming together. Um, so so it's, it's tricky with the UN. But I, I completely agree. If you don't engage, um, then then you, you're you're not even in the game. Uh, um, yeah, just to I'm... quickly add, I think another player that I mean, um, folks are tracking. Um, I know the Indian government is really invested in is the World Trade Organization. Mm -hmm. um, specifically on the question now we're seeing with TikTok, um, this idea of national security exceptions for not engaging with uh, foreign companies. I think that's going to become a tricky um, space. Um, and it'd be interesting to find out if WTO kind of steps in as a watchdog um, and we kind of, and whether we want that. So I think that's going to be the next step of maybe the engagement on this issue. Um, and just going back to what Rebecca mentioned, um, the technical standard setting organizations um, and the engagement that came from a lot of, um, you know, Southern civil societies and governments was a call for open internet and a multi-stakeholder internet. Um, so the, if you look at the Indian government submissions back then, um, there was a clear kind of recognition of why we want internet governance to be multi-stakeholder. Um, but if you look at the Indian government's submissions now to the UN open-ended working group, um, you can see that it's day and night. Uh, now it's about data ownership and it's about, um, you know, how do you um, generate value or extract value from data. Um, so I think we're stepping into a tricky period, right? The same multilateral organizations 
um, responding um, to these questions now, um, are kind of responding to governments who are more antagonistic about some of these, um, which is kind of diametrically opposite to what we saw the past decade um, when it came to you know, open internet. We have a wonderfully written question from Megan Byrne uh, about what the actual threat is that we're worried about from TikTok. Uh, she writes, are we really worried that an app that thinks I'm a cottage core witch and serves up content of people in chicken soups playing the drums is an imminent threat? Um, I, I guess, you know, I think what, what she's saying is, uh, you know, we, we've talked a lot about uh, the Trump administration's response to TikTok as an overreaction and its uh, sort of impact on the global internet. But, you know, are there, are there reasons for concern about uh, TikTok and some of these other apps we're talking about? I mean, it, it, is there sort of like a, a kernel of truth to, um, to the worries here? Well, if I could talk about it for a minute, you know, with TikTok specifically, and I, I, I talked about this a, a little bit before, you know, there is an algorithm that recommends content. And, and, and so it could be used to spread disinformation um, or, or it, it could help someone <laughs> spread in, in disinformation across TikTok in a way that, that, that could be politically material or otherwise material. So, so there's that. There's, you know, I, I agree kind of the, the ability to track um, what TikTok teens are doing on TikTok. I, I, you know, I, I'd be more worried, worried about, you know, other Chinese companies like Huawei and, and, and kind of their positioning within networks before for TikTok um, uh, in that. But, you know, that said, you know, WeChat is one of the other apps that, that was targeted by the administration. I won't put that on my phone because I used to work in China. I used to work in Hong Kong. I work on human rights issues. I don't want WeChat anywhere close to my contact, <laughs> right? My, my, my network of contact, but that's my personal security threat. Um, I, I do agree with the court decision blocking the Trump administration's executive order to, to block WeChat and TikTok on First Amendment grounds. It was overbroad. Um, that that it you know there are lots of people on these networks who who, who depend on them to communicate um, and to exercise their right to expression that are unrelated to these security threats that are ostensibly the reason for the block. So so you know it, it, again yes it, it's not that there's zero security issues um, uh, and it's it's not that say a European government might feel that. Facebook has zero security issues in regarding, you know, our government's access to, to Facebook data. Um, but not to not to say that that's entirely equivalent. But again, th there are issues um, uh, that need to be addressed. The, the question is how you go about addressing them uh, in a way that really protects people. I, I would also add that we have multiple ways of fighting these algorithms. Uh, and one of them is greatly enhanced digital literacy, right? If you understand that these algorithms are essentially uh, encouraging your worst self, right? That they are, they are, that whatever you like, they're going to push that into an extremely, an increasingly extreme direction. A, you may p click on fewer of them, you'll understand that you are not actually seeing uh, a, a representative section of what others are seeing. So part of what we have to do to push back is really to get people to understand uh, what, you know, things like deep fakes, things, the, the sort of the, the origins of a lot of what we consume and how the algorithms radically skew our perception of reality. Um, and just to quickly add, um, there were instances that were reported about, about um, shadow banning on TikTok, which is mirrors what Rebecca just mentioned right now. Essentially, um, content um, you know, propagating in, you know, Hindu-Muslim unity um, that were you know, circulated on TikTok. Essentially, a lot of that kind of vanished from uh, the page. I think the feed it's called. Uh, I'm not on TikTok, as you can um, see. But um, so there were cases of shadow banning. Um, and that's, I think, um, you know, been one of the civil society concerns as well, um, that there have been reported instances of TikTok kind of censoring content on their platform. Uh, Helen Belgrave asked a question, which uh, 
think uh, probably for Anne Marie, but given that foreign policy and internet policy are inextricably linked, does that mean that internet splintering, internet splintering, it's hard to say, is just inevitable based on current geopolitics? Based on current geopolitics, as in right now, uh, at, and if, if the Trump administration were reelected, yes, I, 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 there, the, the, the strongest voice against it might be the European Union, uh, but the European Union is not in a strong foreign policy place right now. I wish they were. I wish they were in far stronger position. Uh, but yes, I mean, you are, it, 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 for one thing, in, as the whole discussion of TikTok and WeChat reflect, this is Trump against China, much more than it is actually looking at the harms, uh, to, to Megan's question, uh, of being done to individuals. And so for one thing, the internet just becomes another weapon, right? You, can, <laughs> you, try, you, you push back against an adversary by striking at their companies on the internet, just as you put sanctions on importers and exporters. Uh, so yes, I think right now, uh, the, you, you, every time you hear we're back in an age of great power competition, which you do also hear from Democrats as well as Republicans, with, with a certain amount of, well, at least we understand how this game is played, uh, then that is not a force uh, for the kind of internet we are talking about. Uh, I, if, you, if you have a US government working with a number of other countries around the world, not just in Europe, but in Asia. Uh, I, I, it'd be interesting to see an Indian, some Indian government probably would play here uh, that says, look, we, we've got a value-based foreign policy. We think that our power lies in the end in the strength of our values, which means we have to live them at home uh, as well as abroad, which is why we have so much dr uh, deep work to do uh, at home, you can then imagine saying, you know, our values, as I started, say there's a, there are universal human rights, all human beings are, are created equal, are entitled to life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. What does that look like online? And you then push that vision. Uh, but it requires a, a, a powerful country working with lots of other countries to push that vision. Civil society can play a really important role, companies can play a role, but you can't do it alone. Yeah, that, that's a good transition to a, uh, a point that Michelle Ashkar makes, which I think will be a good note to end on. Um, you know, we're always addressing governments and companies in this discussion, but there's a third player here, people. Um, so, you know, as users of the internet, uh, what, are, what are our responsibilities and what are things that uh, we can do to promote a kind of open, more international internet uh, that we'd all like to see. And it'd be great if all three of you could answer this one and then we'll wrap up. You wanna start, Madhu? Sure, so um, what I have been thinking about is um, people kind of pushing for more transparency from governments when it comes to the kind of information controls um, that they employ to ban an app like TikTok. Um, so the same information controls you use to shut down the internet, right? Um, so I think that's gonna be a space that we should kind of watch out for and kind of push for more um, information, policy rationale, statistics from uh, governments. Yeah, um, if, if I could just follow on that, um, we have to be citizens of the internet, not just users of the internet, right? We have to, just as, you know, I'm, I'm here on my balcony in DC, um, you know, you could be in any given city. Uh, if I want this city to be run in a way that protects my interests and respects my rights, I have to engage, I have to vote. Uh, you know, I, I have to exercise whatever levers of power as a consumer, you know, et, et cetera, as I, as I can. And similarly, I think in the early days, you know, people kind of just assume the internet just kind of is the way it is. The, the, the internet will only serve human rights and it will only serve the kind of society that we want to have if everybody takes responsibility. If every employee in these tech companies, every executive in these tech companies takes responsibility 
for that vision. Every government official who has any power over how the internet is regulated and every person um, who uses the internet, we can make choices. Um, we can also, you know, civil society has a, a huge role to play, um, but, but also just as citizens in terms of how we use the internet, what tools we choose to use, how we vote, actually does make a, a difference as well. I mean, we're, we're talking a lot, I think it's sort of a, a revival of the understanding that governments, the, the next step in this story depends on government and, and depends on which governments are empowered to represent what ideas. We gotta vote <laughs> and it matters um, for all kinds of reasons um, in, in all of our countries. So I know we're at time, I will add uh, two sentences. Yes, we have to vote. We have to think about this as government policy like anything else, but we also have to hold the companies accountable. Uh, and again, ranking digital rights is one way of doing that. But we're in an age where everyone's asking, do you know where your food comes from? Do you know what practices this company engages in with res regard to child labor, right? We, we, it's an era of transparency where you have to be a conscious consumer we can also be conscious consumers of, of our internet uh, services in all those different ways by finding out, does this company respect rights? Uh, and we have a way to do so. And it is that then sends a message to companies that consumers care. Great, well, I, I wanna thank Madhu, Rebecca, and Anne-Marie so much for sharing their time and their insights with us today and also uh, OTI and Future Tense for sponsoring this conversation. Uh, just an announcement, next week on October 7th, Future Tense is going to be hosting an event on the use of Twitter by diplomats, and that will feature the uh, Mexican ambassador to the U.S., Martha Barcena, and the U.S. ambassador to Mexico, uh, Christopher Landau. So that should be uh, another really interesting uh, conversation. So uh, thank you to all and to everyone who tuned in. And uh, have a great rest of the day.